Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back. Welcome to a really special edition of Twaloha at Home. Uh, I'm going to keep this intro, these announcements, really brief because today is not about me. Today is about listening to Black voices. And we are honored to have two special guests, two Black voices who will be joining us today for the next hour. Excited to talk to two new friends. Chris Marshall will be joining us from Atlanta and Joelle Leon will be joining us from Brooklyn, New York. And so we're gonna spend about 30 minutes which, with each of these two. And I wanna say from the beginning, and I say this on behalf of our team, on behalf of the organization, we believe that black lives matter. And with that, we know that black people are whole people. And in order to live out the belief that black lives matter, we have to acknowledge that that black people have a mental health experience. And so today is about the intersection of race and mental health. And also specific to this moment we find ourselves in today is about the intersection of racism and mental health. And we are turning the comments off. It's the first time that we've done that. And that is simply to be a picture of the fact that we are here to listen and honor and learn from our two guests today. And we're actually gonna take it a step further when we post this, uh, once we're done with the live, when it goes up on IGTV, we would ask that only black people would comment so that we can continue to hear from black voices, so that we can continue to listen and learn from black voices, not only during this live conversation, but also in the conversation that follows this one. And one exception, there is a way that you can participate. There's a way that you can contribute. We are leaving the questions open. So if you have a question for Chris or for Joel, you are welcome. You are invited to submit a question. There's a question mark icon in a little box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question, we're definitely gonna to get to a couple of those throughout. And with that, I'm gonna bring on Chris Marshall. And Chris is joining us. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's, it's good to see you. It is good to see you too. How are you? I'm good. We just talked on the phone not so long ago. We did. That was a good chat. It was a really good chat. And I know LA is home, but you are in Atlanta, Georgia right now, right? I am. I, when I came here, I had no idea that the world would um, erupt while I was gone. And I have to say it has just been such, um, such a crazy, fortunate experience to be here with my family. Um, obviously, I love my friends. Um, I love my husband. I'm, I'm married to a white man. But there is something that is so nurturing and so fulfilling with being with people who you don't have to explain, have to translate. Um, and I hope that as I'm saying this, that I hope that as I say everything, that what I'm saying is taken in the spirit in which I mean it, which is um, from love and from understanding and just trying to do my part to just illuminate people of you know what my experience is like but you know I kind of said to a girlfriend of mine that it's sort of like if you learn English as your second language you know you know it fluently but there's always that mother tongue that's in your ear that there is no translation and that's how it feels to be home yeah so how long has it been what a couple months now so I've been home for just two weeks okay yeah. two weeks got it, got yeah, it. yeah um so we're gonna get to our mutual friend and we will yeah. get to um, our mutual friend is a castmate of yours on the show for all mankind. 
but I think as a place to start, uh, you are a daughter, you are a wife. I wonder if you could just share a few <laughs> of the other hats that you wear. Yeah, uh, I am a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm an actor. I'm a black woman in case y'all hadn't noticed. Uh, and you know, it's funny, like, I've never lived my life as anybody else. I didn't get to do my first round as a, you know, six foot four white man. Like this is, this is my only I'm time doing on that. earth. I'm actually doing it's that. Nice. <laughs> it's nice. Are you guys having fun? It looks like a nice time for you guys. We have a lot to learn. <laughs> uh, so yeah, those are sort of my monikers, but beneath that all, um, without sounding trite, I think I'm an empathic person. Um, it means so much to me. And as you know, you came to me with this opportunity to come on and have a conversation. And my first thought was, what do I have to say? You know, what, what light can I bring to this? What, what responsibility can I uphold? Because I'm just me, you know, I, I, I don't have a voice in this and people who are smarter than me and wiser than me and, and have gone to school for this, they should be the ones that you should talk to. Don't bother me, Jamie, please. Let me just sit back with the rest of the ding-dongs. And when you and I had that conversation and you just said, you know, your voice matters. Of course it matters. I want to hear from you. It just dawned on me that, you know, for such a long time, I think the world has kind of placed that um, sort of burden on women um, and that burden on black women that you guys should sit back and, and let other people who are wiser, smarter, stronger, male, we'll take it from here. Um, so this experience, this little microcosm of you asking me and me saying first no, and then eventually saying yes, um, is a microcosm for a lot of what life is like to be a black woman. Hmm. I know, uh, I know she would not want to be the hero in today's story, but I want to acknowledge the person who connected us, um, someone who I think really highly of, and I know this person just raves about you. So our mutual friend is Chantel Van Santen, who is your co-star on For All Mankind. And I wonder if you wanna share anything about that friendship, because it sounds like it, it means the world to her. It, the feeling is mutual. Um, she is such an open spirit and such a great girl. And when all of this was sort of erupting, I guess you guys had already had a, a planned talk about mental health and her journey with mental health and being in therapy. And so it sort of fell in this moment. And Chantel said to you, um, thank you for the opportunity. I don't know if the voice of a white woman is what the world needs right now. I think that I wanna pass this opportunity over to my, my girlfriend, Chris. And so she brought it to me. And like I said, immediately I was like, girl, man, no, no, I, I, mm, 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 no, I'm not about to get on the internet and say the wrong thing and have everybody hate me. Not today, nope, nope, I will sit back. Um, but yeah, she just reminded me that, you know, there are girls like me out there who have what on the outside might look like an easy life, you know, and they could say, I, I don't have a, a, a role in this. I don't know what to even say to inspire others. And I'm seeing now in this moment that, that that's just not true, you know? So thank you for the opportunity and thank you for Chantel for putting my hat in the ring. Absolutely. So I wonder, we, we touched on this a little bit when we spoke earlier, but we did not have an audience earlier, but I wonder um, part of what she shared was that you guys have had a dialogue about mental health, about each other's mental health. And, and so I wonder just when did you become aware of those two words or, or how that related to your own life, your own story? When does mental health enter the picture for you? Um, you know, I, I, as I speak to you now, I can feel like my, my chest heaving and my hands shaking because this for me is, um, it's such thick and rife territory with emotion and with guilt and with responsibility. Um, you know, when we talk about our ancestors and we talk about the history, people think about like, how long ago was this? We're talking about, you know, the Mayflower and the Nina the Pinta, like, but truthfully, I'm talking about my great grandmother. I'm talking about my great grandfather, people who are not some distant ancestors, but the people who in baby photos are holding me in their arms. Mm -hmm. um, friends who are close to me know the history of my family 
um, my great grandfather was lynched and he survived his lynching. Um, my family found out about his lynching and this is back in the 1920s when although slavery was over, uh, that didn't make difference um, to the way that black people were treated and my family were uh, sharecroppers. And so God knows what minor infraction that my gra great grandfather did or didn't do, but the result ended in him being grabbed up in the middle of the night, hung from a tree by a lynch mob. And so they waited until he died and then they all went to bed. And per usual, black families back then went and you cut down your dead to bury them. And when my family went to cut him down, he was still alive. Uh, so I literally would not be here if my family had not persevered that kind of um, strength and face, face to face with murder. Mm. So my family got my great grandfather out in the dead of night and they had to relocate because back then, if you survived the lynching, they just came back the next day and tried all over again. Yeah. So, you know, this family history sounds probably pretty extraordinary to people who are hearing this right now, but I would bet you money that most black Americans have some version of this story in their, in their history. And the lovely thing of being home right now with my mom is that she's sharing these stories with me and they, they touch me and I look at her and think to myself, how, how did you survive this? How did you come out, you know, the other side? My mom, it's not, again, not history, distant history. My actual mom upstairs in that house was integrated into schools in the fifth grade. She spent the first 11 years of her life going to separate schools. Yeah. And she tells me stories about how when she was a little girl, she had never met a white person because the neighborhoods where, this is where yeah. black people live, this is where white people live, and there is no in between. Um, so she was bused for over an hour to go to an all-white school, and she was one, I think, of four kids in her uh, fifth grade class who were Black. And so for me to now be in a world where I can marry who I want, I can be dear, dear good friends with Chantel, and no one blinks an eye about it, we've come so far, and yet we still have so far to go. So coming back full circle to the conversation of mental health, you know, when my great great grandparents are literally cutting people out of trees and my mom is being faced with the National Guard as she enters her elementary school, there really isn't an opportunity to talk about self care and anxiety and depression and all the things that human beings have experienced for such a long time. But when actually trying to survive is the most important thing for my great grandparents and then for my mom trying to get to school every day and not get rocks thrown at her. And now for my generation, I am the first person in my family to go to individual and couples counseling. I'm the first person in my family to have that opportunity because thank God my, my mother is a loving and wonderful person and also a successful person. You know, the conversation is both about access to mental health and also about economics. Um, spoiler alert, it's expensive to go yeah. to a therapist. And oftentimes it's not covered by health insurance. So unfortunately for the black community, you know, we've got this gigantic cross to bear of being seen as less than worthless, valueless by the world. And then we also have this internal experience of wanting to work like hell to prove to people that we're not what they say about us mm -hmm. and work like hell to not be those stereotypes and also find a way in the midst of all that to have healthy romantic relationships to have healthy self-esteem, to think highly of yourself. You know, I, I feel like I work really hard at, at seeing the best in me. And even now you ask me to participate in an opportunity. And my first thought is I'm not good enough for that. Mm. It, 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 it just brings so much pain to me because I know that, that there are so many girls like me out there who have experienced so much just exhaustive pain and they don't know what to do with it. And so part of me was afraid in having this conversation to let the world know that I go to therapy, to let the world know that I don't have it all figured out. But then I remind myself that like, I have to be, whether I want to or not, I have to be that example and that, that, um, that instance in the world where girls like me can see that you don't have to always have it together, that it's okay to ask for help, 
that it's okay to have problems and to seek advice and seek counsel from others. So that's where I land in the mental health conversation. Um, it's taken me a long time and I'm still in this moment struggling to admit to myself and to the people in my life that, that I have struggled with anxiety and depression um, and I'm moving through it. And that means a lot to me. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for sharing all of that. Um, I wish I, I would give you, I would give you a hug, but for various reasons, <laughs> yes, a distant technological hug. Um, you mentioned access, you mentioned finances as it relates to getting professional help. I wonder if you encountered a stigma, whether that was within your family or friends as you began to learn and think about mental health and, and also to to maybe get to a place of taking that step where it was like, hey, I, I might need to talk to someone. Absolutely. Um, and I don't want to victimize myself and say, oh my God, what was me? You know, the people in my life wouldn't let me go to, absolutely not true. From my family, there was en encouragement, um, curiosity, and frankly, some defensiveness. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I am one of the lucky ones. I went to great schools. I went to private schools. I went to arts conservatory. Um, I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from. Um, and so I think from my family and from within myself, there was a sense of, well, what, what, do you, what do you have to be so upset about? What do you have to be so afraid of? What, what do you mean you're anxious? What do you mean depressed? Look around you, you have a nice life. You have no, no right to that. And so that guilt, I think, um, is universal. I think people everywhere, not just black people or women, but people everywhere experience that feeling of self shame of I should be able to get this together. I also think that, you know, there's a double edged sword in the way that the world perceives black women. Um, we're often perceived as strong and fearless and, you know, full of piss and vinegar. Um, and as I just told you stories about, you know, my family who grab a man out of a tree and rescue him to another city and state, but we aren't always that. True. And we shouldn't have to always be that. We shouldn't have to always shoulder an entire race or an entire family like my mom did was a single mom and God bless that she did it. Um, you know, I hope she's not too upset about me telling this, this bit of information, but and when I was little, I was four and my dad passed away from uh, pancreatic failure, pancreatic cancer. And I remember growing up and saying to my mom, wow, you know, I was four and Tracy, my sister was 11. You know, we were little. Uh, did you just lay down and cry? Didn't you just want to lay down and die? You know, my, my mom was in her thirties when she became a widow. She was a baby in the grand yeah. scheme of things. My dad was under 40 when he passed away. And my mom would always say to me when I was little, I didn't have the luxury to lay around and cry. I didn't have time for that. I had little girls to raise. I had a mortgage to pay. I had a car payment to pay. I had school fees to pay for. And so I put one foot in front of the other and I moved forward. And so I, as a little girl, made that internal vow unknowingly that that kind of strength was what was expected of me. And so I'm equally so grateful for my mother for having set that example. And at the same time, I see now that strength has so many facets. And sometimes strength does mean lying down and just crying. Um, so when you know better, you do better. And now, you know, she's in her 60s. And now we continue to have these conversations when I come home. And sometimes we laugh and sometimes we yell and sometimes we cry, but we're moving through it and finding what the other facets are of strength which is vulnerability, which is openness, which is honestness. Um, so that's that. <laughs> yeah. um, I've been trying, we've been, we've been having these conversations throughout the pandemic. So for a couple months, we call it Twaloha at home because most people are at home. And I've, I've tried, and it comes from a real curiosity, but to ask people what, what has prioritizing mental health looked like for you in this season? Mm -hmm. What has self-care looked like for you? And we now find ourselves in another unique season within this pandemic. And so I wonder, um, even over the last 
eight or nine days, just, just what, what have those, have you been conscious of those things in terms of your mental and emotional health? Um, just, just maybe any, just a bit of maybe what you've been feeling and processing, if you don't mind sharing that. Um, if I were to give myself a grade on how I've been processing, I, I mean, I may have to give myself a C minus because it's been tough. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> as I said, I, I have never seen anything like what's happening in the world right now. <clears throat> and talking to my mom who lived through the civil rights era, she has never seen anything like what we see right now. Um, and I actually take back that grade I give myself because the truth is that, you know, I, I don't know how to do it right. Um, I think having this conversation right now is the first step. Um, I, the other day I wrote a very um, raw and very honest post on social media that as I typed it out, I could feel my fingers wet with sweat slipping on the keys. Um, but for me, I'm trying my best to just practice radical honesty. Yeah. So radical that I may lose friends don't leave friends. But <laughs> I find myself just like a, a vessel of truth. And, you know, I would hope that um, anybody who has a chance, please take a look at my post because I spoke from a place of real truth and saying that I'm letting the cat out of the bag here. But as a black woman, and probably as a black man too, I, I've never been a black man before, but as a black woman, you learn to lie you learn to be pulled over by a cop who approaches your car with his hand already on the holster. The first thing he says is not license and registration. The first thing he says is, whose car is this? Uh, you learn to speak in your most white voice when you speak to someone of authority. Um, you learn to have that aggressively terrifying, trying experience receive the ticket from the officer, pull into your office and go, good morning, everybody. Hey, David, how's it going? How was the weekend? How are the girls? Did they win the soccer match? You learn to be a bullshit artist because mm. you can't, you can't go, I can't walk on set and folks say, hey, Chris, how's it going? And I tell the actual truth of what I'm going through. I can't do that. You know, a few weeks ago, the girls and I, from my show, we did, um, a, a fun little pandemic talk where we just, each of us spent 30 minutes talking and Chantel was our host. And we talked about, you know, what we're doing in quarantine and we talked about for all mankind and we just had an open dialogue. And unbeknownst to me in the comments, someone beneath wrote, nigger, 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 nigger. Thank God I continued the conversation and just looked at my friend and carried on. And it wasn't until later when I watched the playback that I saw, oh my God, you know, someone just spent their entire 30 minutes just typing out N I double G A. And that, and, and, and Chantel saw it and she blocked him and she said to me, I am so sorry that happened. And my response was, this is it. This is my life. That shouldn't have to be. And I'm seeing now as painful as it is for all of us to just excavate and tear up and lance all of these boils this is the way in which we move forward you know police officers don't just wake up in the morning and decide to shoot black people it it, it siphons down it begins with taking two job applications one that says jennifer jones and one that says rashida jones and tossing rashida in the in the rubbish and putting jennifer on the top of the pile it goes down beneath that to stopping in traffic and seeing somebody black cut you off and saying the N word. It goes down, it, it, the hatred and the venom to people of color, it begins at the nucleus. And so, you know, the grand scheme, the big picture, the thing that's above the iceberg that's on the, the top of the water surface is seeing a man like George Floyd be stomped to death. But it happens long before that. And so I hope that the people who see this um, can say to themselves, holy moly, like, I, I don't, I don't have to fix it all. But what I can do is make sure that when I hire a, a wedding planner, that I look for both black people, white people, Hispanic people, you know, people of all ilks, to find who the best wedding planner is, that I whatever occupation that it is that I'm looking to hire, if I have the position to hire, 
that I look to see, can I bring people of color into my world? Can I make sure that I hire them? Can I make sure that I buy their goods and services? Can I support their businesses? That is how we get out of this quagmire that we're in. So yes, in my opinion, it begins you know, with the police force, but tangentially, we got a lot of other work to do at the exact same time. Yeah. Um, I wonder what, this is a bit of a transition, but what have you found in counseling? Some people say therapy, some people say counseling, but what has that experience mm -hmm. been like? And I wonder maybe also what it's been like to share, to kind of report back to your family. You may want to ask them what that's like. <laughs> as they say, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. Uh, I got a lot to tell her about, you did, and you did. Why didn't you? Um, so what have I learned? Well, the first thing I've learned is uh, that I don't have to be perfect, that I don't have to get it right, um, that I don't have to be the world's biggest success, Halle Berry level, enormous, famous, successful, buying everybody's cars and mortgages. I don't have to do all that. All I have to do <clears throat> is pursue my craft, which I love so dearly, which makes me excited to do every day. And I feel, um, and I'm not a religious person, but I feel like I was really meant to do this because I just love it so much. Mm. That's what I can do. Um, I've also learned to accept my shortcomings. A big thing I see both in myself and in the other people in my family is there's a lot of defensiveness. Um, defensiveness around mistakes that were made, defensiveness around choices that could have been made differently. And I think a lot of that comes from this need to be so strong, to hold it all up. And I'm learning in my time in therapy that if I make a mistake, it doesn't mean that I'm weak. It doesn't mean that I'm a failure. It doesn't mean that I'm a big fat fuck up. What it means is that I'm a human being who made a mistake. And so I'm learning as best as I can to apologize when I see my, my faults um, when people bring to me something that I've said or done that didn't feel so good, rather than say, well, you just took it in the wrong way. Say, okay, I may have intended something else, but the impact was really hurtful for somebody that I, that I know and love. I should apologize. I'm going to apologize. It cost me nothing. Yeah. Um, so kind of putting some, some um, bumpers, like when you go bowling, around um, the, the idea of getting it right and doing it right and staying in the right lane. I don't have to do all that. I can just be me. Um, these are, for me, the, the biggest lessons I've taken away from being in therapy. Um, as you look ahead, kind of beyond this moment, I wonder um, what is your hope or even some of your hopes that can come, like maybe where we find ourselves in six months or a year? I know that's a, an enormous question, but you could even start, maybe I'd ask, are you hopeful? <laughs> and then maybe what are you hopeful for? Uh, as long as the murder hornets don't get us first. <laughs> uh, I am an optimistic person. I, I think uh, you kind of can't help to be, you know, when you experience a, a good amount of adversity. And, um, you know, my mom was one of nine kids. Uh, food security was a big thing for them, wondering where their next meal would come from. She tells me stories about when she was little, they only ate meat on Wednesdays and Sundays because they couldn't afford it all seven days of the week. Mm. Um, so what I'm hopeful for is that whoever sees this, that, that people who can hear my voice um, take with them that it's important that they protest, it's important that they donate, but even outside of those sort of bigger, more obvious ways that they can become activists in their life, what they can do is if you see someone treated poorly, just say something, mm. you know? If you see a shop girl being absolutely, undeniably racist and rude to somebody else in the shop, tap her on the shoulder and let her know, hey, um, I saw the way you just treated that person and I really didn't like that. It didn't sit right with me, I just wanna let you know that. It doesn't have to be a confrontation, it doesn't have to be aggressive. There are ways in which all of us can let each other know and keep each other in line and say, I saw what you just did and I didn't like it. You know, another thing I posted about this the other day is, you know, uh, people who aren't of color, they can find ways to <clears throat> validate and incorporate black beauty and black value into their lives. You can do that with as simply as 
um, showing your kids that a black baby doll is just as beautiful as a white baby doll and, and showing up to a birthday party or, or to a baby shower with a beautiful black baby doll and saying congratulations on your new baby. The mother may be a little bit surprised, but you know what? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Finding ways to, to encourage that value that we have, the beauty that we have, the worth that we have. I think that to me, those seeds can be planted all throughout. And if all 100 and something people who are watching this can just tell one or two people about it, it will continue and it will hopefully change our world. No, oh, I agree. Um, thank you so much. I, I wish uh, I could talk to you and listen to you for, for a long time. This has been great. I'm, I was uh, so nervous that this is, I had such a wonderful time talking to you. Oh, uh, well, Likewise, we are, we're really grateful and um, hopefully we can, we can talk again and hang out in real life someday. And uh, yeah, thank you. I'm sure Chantel is watching. So thank you for uh, bringing her into our world. And um, Chris, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your time at home with your mom. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, that was Chris Marshall. She is wonderful. Man, I enjoyed listening to her. And uh, again, follow her, watch her show for all mankind. And she talked about some recent posts that uh, we hope you will check out. And before I bring on Joelle, I, there's something I forgot to mention at the, at the start. I am really proud of our team uh, for two different things that we've been able to share. On Tuesday, we shared, I'm looking at it now, a really extensive list of mental health resources, mental health resources created by and for Black people. And so if you go to tuoloha.com, if you go to our website, you will find an extensive list that we are really proud of. Um, please share that, please take advantage of that. And with that, you can also apply for scholarship dollars. Chris talked about the financial barrier that exists for so many people and for people of color. And so we want to do our small part, part of what we do as an organization, part of what we've done for 14 years is help people pay for counseling and treatment. And so we want to we want you to know, we especially want black people to know that we are able to offer this list and we invite you to apply uh, if finances are a challenge or a barrier for you. And then the other thing that we actually just posted today is an invitation to learn and practice anti-racism, right? We know that it's not enough to simply not be racist, but we have to go beyond that and we have to practice anti-racism. The post that we shared today, we have to be part of ending racism and that requires us to do more than just believe in equality. We have to learn and practice anti-racism. And so you will find another extensive list uh, for people who are wondering, what can I read? What can I listen to? How can I learn? How can I educate myself? Uh, it's, a, it's a really incredible list. Um, articles, books, podcasts, so many different things. Some of it points back to social media, ways to support anti-racism financially. So we would invite you to our website to check out both of those. Again, mental health resources for and from the black community, scholarship dollars that are available, and then an invitation to learn and practice anti-racism. And with that, we're gonna bring on our second guest, Mr. Joel Leon. Let's see. All right. Hey, man. My brother. You're Thank looking you. sharp. Uh, you know, I, I was trying to, you know, man, I was trying to get ready and write. You know what I'm saying? I feel like this is an important conversation. I didn't want to look we like a, We talked earlier, and I don't remember the button shirt, but it, it looks yeah, good. Yeah, I changed it up, man. I switched it up on you. I wasn't sure if you were going to recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> Throw you off your game. You know what I'm saying? Oh, man. Pleasure well, I, I enjoyed our conversation earlier, which was our first conversation ever. And I'm so excited to, 
to do it again, to talk to you and also to be able to introduce you, not, not for the first time, but in this moment to, to our community. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like, I, did you recently change your Instagram bio? Um, I mean, somewhat recently. I, I think I, I changed it, um, I wanna say, maybe tail end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I know, um, I know you wear a number of hats, even professionally. Um, but I, I, I went, I noticed today that it, it says, I tell stories for black people. Um, I wonder if you could just briefly introduce yourself and introduce some of the work that you do. I, I would absolutely love to. Um, you know, for those not in the know, my name is Joel, Joel Leon. Um, I, yeah, I, I write and tell stories to black people, man. And really my work, and what I've kind of been honing in on um, as far as like my purpose in, in the work goes, it's like um, I use my creative practice to uh, uplift community and decolonize systems. So those systems primarily being um, white supremacy, uh, um, masculinity, um, the patriarchy, uh, uh, the, 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 the mental health conversation and, and arts, um, mm -hmm. you know, cause, cause I am very much so an, an artist first I'm also a black man, um, and, and, and I identify as such, and I, and I very closely identify to that. And so the work for me very much lives in the same vein of the Toni Morrison, who um, was very explicit about how she does not write for the white gaze, um, which does not prevent, like, we're having a conversation now, right? And we had a conversation before, because I love you and I love the work that you do. And it doesn't prohibit um, white allies and, and accomplices to, to, to join in on the conversation and be a part of the work, but I try to make it very clear when I'm leading a workshop, when I'm performing on stage, like, I love y'all, but this is, for, this is for these people, you know, and I hope you get something from it, but it's for them. Always. Yeah. Um, can we add to that list? I know you are a girl dad. I am definitely a girl a, dad. A proud girl dad. Very much so. Uh, what, what else? Uh, <laughs> I'm guessing you're a son. <laughs> I am a son. I'm a brother. You know, I have, I have three siblings. I have, I'm, I'm the youngest of all of, 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 of the four. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a lover, I'm a, I'm a devoted partner. I'm a, uh, you know, um, and, and, I, and I say storyteller because I think it, it, it's easier to encompass all the things because, you know, I'm a hip hop artist. I'm, I'm a spoken word poet, I'm an actor, you know, like um, any way I see fit um, to, to create and use my art for the greater good of the community is kind of where I try to show up. And it, it really depends on the medium. And that medium changes, I think, depending on the season, depending on the moment. And born and raised in New York, right? In the Bronx, man. The, the, the birthplace of hip hop. You know, shout out to Grandmaster Kaz. You know what I'm saying? Furious Five, um, Grandmaster Flash, uh, Africa Bambata, you know, Cool Herc. Yeah. You know. Man, um, I got that. That's another area I have a lot to learn. <laughs> I mean, you know, hip, you know, we, you know, hip hop is so ingrained in our culture, and, and I, I try to, I try to explain to folks like pop culture is black culture. You know, mm -hmm. the things that folks love about TikTok, the things that 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 folks love using gifs for, and and like a lot of this is pulled from black culture. You know, the folks that love Elvis Presley, you know, have to make sure that they love Little Richard. Mm -hmm. and, in the same vein that, that they have to recognize Chuck Berry in the same yeah. vein, you know, B.B. King and, and even Leg Belly. You know, when, when we look at some of the work that Kurt, um, Kurt Cobain, God bless the dead, mm. um, he, he, he did a rendition of a Leg Belly song on, on MTV Club. And a lot of folks don't know like Leg Belly was a black man, fully ingrained in folk music and Americana. And so I think part of the work for us is to really, you know, like we had, when we were talking in the conversation with Avi Man about the history, a lot of folks mm. know the history, yeah. you know? And so the work, I think, to kind of debunking some of the mystification of like black art and then also uh, deconstructing white supremacy, it's about knowing the history of the yeah. work. Well, obviously I wanna get to kind of this moment in history that we find ourselves in, um, but I wanna back up. I, I asked Chris the same thing, but kind of when does mental health show up on your radar personally? When does that, yeah. enter your story and and when do you realize hey this this applies to me you know that i think that's a really important question and a powerful question jamie I, and 
and I, and I forgot to and I forgot to mention this. Thank you um, for this platform and this space. Um, you know, again, prior to like for our conversation before earlier, you know, to write love in her arms really gave me an opportunity to kind of speak to the to, to the experience of blackness in the mental health community and in my experience personally, because it's different for everybody. Mm. Uh, but you know, I didn't have the language early on. You know, I I, I knew very growing up in the Bronx and, and kind of growing up um, in trauma and the environment, like the outside environment and also in, like in, in the home environment. My father, um, a, a beautiful human, but who, who, who suffered, had his own demons, um, uh, paranoid schizophrenic, um, alcohol dependency, like a lot of things weren't like, a lot of the DSM-4 diagnoses, you pick or choose, um, bipolar disorder. Um, so like, there was a lot of like tension in, in the household. And I think for me, uh, a child who grew up, uh, you know, slightly bigger than some Husky, is what we used to call it back in the day. Um, I, I didn't like myself for a while. And I think even coming of age, when we move further down the line, um, college, well, I struggled a lot with like wanting to be the best version of myself for everybody but myself. And so that led to a lot of suicidal ideations and, and conflicts with like who I was. You know, I, I was I was also sexually abused as a child. And so I think a lot of my work as a black man was trying to unpack that, um, trying to unpack my worth. Um, and also, you know, struggling, struggling with my, my, my own sense of like masculinity and, and recognizing like the feminine energy that I did carry very early on. Mm. And, you know, you, 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 you grow up in a neighborhood in an environment where being soft is is not a is not an option yeah. you know what I'm saying like you, you have to you have to show up in a way um, in a very defined way um, as a man whatever that means right um, and so it, it wasn't until maybe I want to say the, the 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 breakup there was a very um, the, there was a breakup I had when we talked about you know we, you and I had talked about me leaving New York and then Moving to Florida, coming back to New York, I was engaged at a time, and you know I cheated on my partner um, more than once. And so, the um, the conversation was, if you don't if you don't see a therapist, then I don't know how we're gonna make this work. And I had always had uh, the thought in my head that I wanted to seek therapy because I knew there were a lot of things I needed to unpack. And that really started the journey for me, um, as far as like a very tangible means of of looking at it. I had been reading books like Yana Van Zant had put out a book that essentially was catered and directed towards black men. And I think that was more of like my spiritual self-care journey. Therapy really opened up the door to the mental health journey for me because I realized I never really had an opportunity to just speak my truth in a way without projections, without biases, without, um, without my truth being questioned, but more having a person who sat across from me who was willing to help me unpack why those things were truths for me and, and, and learning from those. And so, that's in, we're looking at two, that's like 2009, actually, actually, maybe no, correction, 2012. So at that time, I'm, I'm 29, you know, so we're looking at 29 years of adulthood. I mean, well, not adulthood, but you know what I mean, of like, of living, not knowing and having the, like, the appropriate language. Yeah. Um, and, you know, becoming a father in, in 2015 really peeled back a lot of the, the layers that, um, I had still had yet to really deal with as far as like my worth was concerned. Um, and, you know, I, I had a very close call where I, I was forced to call the suicide hotline and um, got a tremendous amount of support, which led me to write an essay because um, I recognized that there were probably a lot of black men who hadn't been given the space and opportunity to share their stories and maybe had hidden their stories because they weren't sure how to, how to sift through them. And a lot of my work and my purpose has been the ex me experiencing whatever I needed to in order to help others kind of move through their own trauma. And that's really what, what my art is about and my, my creativity stems from. Um, so that coupled with, you know, just being able to, to be, being afforded the opportunity to talk to other black men, women, non-binary folks who, who, who were also struggling with their own um, mental health and their own mental health stories, right? Like, what does that look like? Um, and, and for me, it's, about, it's, it's been about showing up for the community and using my trauma, my past trauma, past experiences with my trauma to help others kind of learn how to 
to better deal in conjunction with a really strong therapeutic model, right? Whether that be holistic treatment, whether that be psychotropic medications, whatever the case, whatever works for the individual in, a, in the treatment plan. Um, and then like, you know, I can't forget, I, 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 I worked in the, social, in the social services field for a while. You know, I have a high school diploma, but a lot of my work was working with the HIV AIDS population, um, the forensic population, which really gave me an opportunity to sit with individuals who had done time in Rikers, who had been diagnosed, some misdiagnosed, um, learning the real language behind um, um, what a GAF score looks like, right? Like DSM-4 diagnoses and, and, and really being able to put that together with some of the framework I already had from my own experience that allows me, I think, to walk into these spaces very comfortably and have the hard conversations in a way that I, I think is needed for the community. I talked to Chris about uh, stigma that she encountered, and, I, and certainly we believe that stigma exists around mental health in general for everyone, but I wonder, um, unique to your experience, what sort of, what, what part or how much of a factor was stigma as, as you kind of approached mental health and therapy and the idea of you stepping into therapy? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it had to do with um, fear of being rejected. You know, um, there's a very strong feeling in the community that um, if, you're, if you're vulnerable, if you're open, especially if you're a black man, being vulnerable, being vulnerable and being open kind of goes back to what we talked about, right? Like um, softness is seen as weakness. And a lot of my work now, especially has been, it, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna be sure and be clear for folks that they, 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 they have the opportunity to, to, to be vulnerable and, and recognize the strength in that and being honest in that vulnerability and being, and being secure in that vulnerability. And we don't, the community is now really just now learning how to create safer spaces for these kinds of conversations and really leading with empathy, which is like what a, a big part of, of how I try to show up with my art for the community. And how I try to show up in conversations when, when we're talking about the black community. It's, it's really being open and empathetic to each other's stories and plights, you know, because yeah. um, everyone's struggle is different. And the stigma really comes to, I, I think, things that, that, that we have yet to, to deal with and unpack. And so how, you know, if, if I haven't learned how to deal with my trauma, how can I expect anyone else to do the same? Um, you know, we, we, we throw around these, like, these, uh, these, these, these adjectives, right? Like, and we were talking about this earlier, like trying to decolonize the language. So as opposed to saying like, oh, that's crazy. Or like, you're acting real crazy right now. Like, what are the other ways we can describe this um, and, and, and in a way that's not being abusive and not being violent? Right, when it comes to the language that we use to describe feelings and emotions and people and behaviors. Um, but that's stuff that I had to learn, you know, and, and the, the, the learning curve is, I think, really steep. Uh, so for me, it's, it's, it's been about how, how do we erase stigma? And erasing stigma is about having the conversations. Folks for a very long time have been afraid to have the conversations because they felt like they're alone. Um, but it, sometimes it just takes a person or a few people to say, nah, like we're, we're all going through it. Like Lauren Hill in her Unplugged CD for MTV, she said something about um, basically like exposing her belly button because when she did that, when she does that, it allows other people to go, oh, you have one too. You know, like we all, we all, we're all sharing the same experience in very different ways. But, but the community has been doing definitely a much better job, but there's still a lot more work for us to do to show yeah. up and ensure that we all have safe spaces to kind of dig into our experiences. Yeah. I got another question for you, but I want to remind people that are watching, if you have a question for Joel, uh, you are invited to submit. So there's a little question mark box at the bottom of your screen, and we would love to get to a question or two sure. from you. Um, I wonder, related to this moment, and this might be hypothetical, but, but my, my guess is it's probably not based on conversations you're having. I feel like it's a moment, uh, a lot of people are thinking about strength and solidarity, strength to protest, strength to stand against racism, stand against evil. Um, but I wonder what you might say to someone who's, and, and maybe even someone in the black community who, who just says, man, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm overwhelmed, I'm anxious. I, 
I'm just having such a hard time. I, I think, I think the work, you know, shame, guilt, and fear, um, I, those are not symptoms of, of love, right? And, and so I think if we're, if, if we're leaning into love and compassion and empathy, part of that is like recognizing that we just have to do something, you know, and, and doing something imperfectly is better than doing nothing at all, right? And, and being able to do that and show up for the community in that way, like, listen, you're gonna make mistakes. And, and if we remove ego out of the way, ego, like I'll give you a prime example. For Blackout Tuesday, there was a very concentrated effort for folks to try to show up for the community. It was mishandled, I think, to a certain extent, especially when we look at how the movement was created by these two black women who very much were not asking for it to happen in the way that it did. Yeah. Um, some folks have said that it was kind of co-opted and potentially mismanaged intentionally. I'm not really here to discuss that. Let's say that is the case. Well, but there they were people who were potentially misinformed, but who were trying to do the right thing. And I think the more we can lean into empathy and recognize this, there's, there's, there's a learning opportunity in, in this way. And for people to be like, okay, you know what? I fucked up. And I think, honestly, Chris was saying something about that towards the end of our conversation with you, right? Where if we, when we remove ego out of the way and, and we remove our defense mechanisms to kind of try to defend behavior, because no one wants to look like they're wrong. It's uncomfortable, right? It's like uncomfortable to feel like I messed this up. What did I do? But I think if we can have grace and mercy and compassion for ourselves to be accountable and accountability allows us the opportunity to, to create forgiveness mm -hmm. as well. So that if I lean into it, like I'm scared, I don't know what to say, say something. Yeah. You know, talk, you know, talk to your black colleagues, talk to your white, to, to, to your white family members and, 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 and those you show up to work with to have those hard conversations, you know, um, I think for a long time, black, black, the black community has been talking to everyone about race. Like yeah. that's part of our job. That's it's literally like we've been doing it for, for centuries. And I think it's time for white allies. And I'm seeing it now. I'm seeing a lot of it now, which has been, it, which I think for me generates a lot of hope and excitement really. Like really having the conversations with the people, with, with their white family members. You know, because it coming from us is clearly not enough, you know, um, but that's that's where the work is. And like, you know, and I like bring, I'm, I'm going to keep bringing up like we talked about earlier, because I think we had such a great conversation. But part of it is that work is sometimes it's ugly and it doesn't get seen like the conversation with your aunt yeah. or your disrespectful best friend who, you know, wants to wants to say wants to say nigga or whatever, like have the conversation with them. And it's not, but you don't have to put it on social media. I don't care about that. Mm. Like, are you having a conversation with them so they're not fucking up the world for like my daughters and, 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 and for the children who are growing up in the world and ensuring that folks are like doing right by the community, yeah. you know? Like it's, it's hard, but it's, it's needed. Like do something, say something, anything, as long as you're doing something and being active and intentional about the work that you're doing. I love it. I'm gonna look at these questions. Yeah, man. Um, this is trying to sip on my water. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. As a mixed but mostly white privileged citizen, what can I do daily to help close this gap? I think it goes right back to Felicia, what, what we were talking about. I think that's a great question. Um, and, and it also, I mean, depending, no matter how you identify on the spectrum, right? And, and I think this is also, this is a broader conversation about um, biracial minorities, right? And identification. When we look at Barack Obama, when, 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 when we look at like, when we look at a very good friend of mine, Tiffany Rose, when, I mean, Felicia, she's speaking to this, to this now. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be important for, 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 for us as a community to a support any and all those who, who identify as black, right? But, but then also ensuring that folks who do and, and see the plight to say something, and it, it's no different than the charge that I'm giving to white allies to say something and do something because there's different parts to a movement. What I like to tell people is like the church, a church, right, has different bodies and different members who all serve a purpose, right? There's gonna be the grandma who cooks, who cooks for folks after service, right? You have the congregation, you have the parish, you have parishioners, right? You have the pastor. You know, there are people who fill certain roles and I think it's important 
to allow people to fill those roles. So whatever your role is going to be, if it's like you're going to show up at a protest, great. Can you couple that with signing a petition and sending it out to your friends? Beautiful, wonderful, do that. If, you're, if, you, if, you, if you don't have able privilege, and maybe it's something different, maybe it's you making meals for, for protesters, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Maybe it's you making calls. Like, whatever you can do, like, it's not, you're not charged with solving the entire story of racism. Like, that's not what your job is. Your job is to do what you can. Because if I do what I can, Jamie does what he can, Felicia does what she can, then we can all, we are, we're doing something collectively, you know? Yeah. Oh, man, we got another good one. Joel, what's your dream for the way the black man sees himself in the future? You know, I think part of black liberation for black men is to ensure that black women and trans black women are liberated as well. Um, because if we focus our energy on, like, how are we showing up for black women in the community? How are we showing up for black non-binary individuals in the community? Um, trans folks, queer folks, and what we're doing really is saying, we're starting with the, the most marginalized, the most discriminated population. Because mm. you do free, you, freedom for them is freedom for everybody. You know what I'm saying? And you can pick up a Bell Hooks book, you can pick up an Angela Davis book, you can read some Audre Lorde and, and understand how important and impactful it's going to be for black men to show up in that way. You know, be, and for me, that's where my, like, my, my thoughts, my processes, my thinking, my spirit, like, you know, Tiffany's, Tiff is asking this question because Tiff knows my story. You know what I'm saying? But like a lot of my learnings came from a, a Tiff, came from a Brittany Pack Yeti, came, mm. came, came from, a, from, from, from a Jamira Burley. You know what I'm saying? Like they come from black women, you know? Um, <laughs> Azor Neil Hurston, like you can name it. I like a Toni Morrison. Um, so black men, we just have to do a better job of that. And there's nothing wrong with over communicating. You know, I think sometimes folks worry about pandering. I don't give a fuck about that, man. It's like, you know, like I have an Afro Latina daughter, I have a black daughter, I have. I have black women in my family, I have black women in my community. There are trans folks in the community who need our support and need our help and need visibility. And the more I can do that and unpack that and unpack the behaviors and the symptomatic behaviors that causes the murders and deaths of this community, the more that black men can actually find their freedom. Mm. So I was gonna try really hard to keep it under an hour, but I wonder if I could, could uh Let's do All it, right. bro. Listen, I'm here for it. All I'm right, so how about we'll, we're about to hit the hour, so how about we'll end this one and jump yeah. right back on? Yeah, I'm in it. Okay. I'm in All it. right, so you guys <laughs> join us in a moment. Yeah, yeah. All right, we are back. Gonna bring on my new friend, Joel. Joel is going to join us again. We're back. No new friends. Fuck that. All new friends. That's what we're <laughs> Yes. New friends. <laughs> um, people are hopping back on, which is awesome. Yeah, um, the only thing I need to mention is we lose the, we lost the questions when we switched over. So if you have a question, yeah, please. Um, please resubmit or submit that. Uh, we're super honored to have Joel and would rather he was answering your questions than mine for the next few <laughs> minutes. Um, so please, if you have a life. question for right. this man, it, uh, there's the little question mark icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, I feel like this, this may be really close to what I asked earlier, but um, I wonder for people that are, their, their mental health is a struggle, yeah. but right now they want to show up for this moment in history they want to they want to show up um they want to play a part in anti-racism they want to participate i wonder if you would have any words of encouragement as as people kind of sign up not just for this moment but but hopefully for the marathon like the day after day um, because i i know for all of us there there's so much information there are so many articles um, and I, we were talking about it. You can almost, we were talking about it earlier where like you can just retweet 20 things and think I, I, I did it today. I showed up, you know, and, um, but I wonder just kind of your thoughts on prioritizing mental health, but how to be balanced right now so that we can continue to show up. You know, you cannot extrapolate mental health and like the work that's required for self-care from the movement. You know, I, I, 
I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of of of, 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 of folks who are very movement oriented but don't get rest and mm. that the body and spirit need it. And you said it; it's a marathon. Like when you're training for a marathon, right? There's like there's a certain way that you have to approach it. There's a certain way you have to approach the work. You know, there's no such thing as like no days off. Like you need days off. Yeah. The work is gonna get done. You know, I I. I and it doesn't mean that we're slacking. It doesn't mean we're lazy. I think going back to what I said earlier, when, when we talk about removing shame, guilt, and fear from the process and moving, removing ego from the process, what that then does is it allows us to, to have more grace and mercy and empathy for ourselves and how we show up for, 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 for social change and for social good. Like if my cup, if my cup is full, I can, I can then, I can then fill it. You know, the, the reason I get to do this work, man, the reason I'm, I get to be active in this way with, with, with the way I approach the art and the way I approach these conversations because I get so filled up with joy and excitement for seeing other folks stepping up. But I also am cognizant of when I need to rest, like, mm. and, and trying to make sure I'm creating space to do that. You know, shout out to the NAP ministry, right? Like, and, and because what, what we're talking about too is like, rest is not just restorative, it's, 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 it's also part of our liberation. Black folks have tend like you can go all the way back to slavery, and I think a lot of that kind of is compounded by that in our history of 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 being of blackness as labor, um, right? So unpacking that means we have to take the opportunity to like rest and lean into each other. You know, I I, I real quick well, what I try to do for, for 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 friends of mine is like I tell them you know to to kind of wake up in the morning and ask yourself what do you need. You know, like, let's say you give yourself a list of five things that you need. Let's say I need a hug. I need a salami sandwich. I need to do this work stuff, whatever, whatever. You then can go down this list of how many things that you've numbered and say, what, what are the things that I can give myself, right? I can make myself a salami sandwich. I can do the work that I need to do for my nine to five or my, my freelance gig or whatever. But the hug, I can't give myself. So now I can reach out to any number of people who potentially can do that for me. Like, listen, I'm struggling homie, homegirl, whatever, can you come through? I know COVID-19 is, is cracking right now, but you know what I'm saying? You can give me a high five, whatever. And that allows the other individual to say, I'm at capacity. I really can't. I'm, unfortunately, I can't show up for you that way, but I can't do this. Or, nah, I got plenty of time. What's good? I'm going to pull up right now. Hugs galore. Whatever. I'm with it. You know, it's, but part of that is being open and honest about where we are and, we're, and, and, and recognizing that. And if we're running low, to replenish ourselves, rest, meditate, laugh, play. Black joy is liberation. But mm. I can tell folks, you know, like you can't, we, we, we struggle sometimes too with like the duality of the trauma and the joy. We get to hold weight for the things that, 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 are, that frighten us, that scare us, that hurt us, while also being celebratory and things that, that, have, that are feeding us life and feeding mm. us love. Like I can be cognizant and very much aware of, of of George Floyd's life, of a of a Sandra Bland's life, while also maybe recognizing like my my, my birthday's coming up or my, my cousin is graduating from college and being able to celebrate that. We we struggle with, with the duality. Like we can't do two things. We recognize yeah. we're more than one thing anyway. The capacity yeah. to hold weight for different feelings is is monumental if we give ourselves the chance to do so. Yeah. I love uh I, I saw a, a post and I forget who who it was from, but it was someone, it was a black woman talking about how even on Blackout Tuesday, there was space for black joy. Yeah. And, and to me, it was cool because I remember she shared that it wasn't like, obviously there, there's all the ways we need to show up and, and, you know, push and protest and tell the truth and educate. Yeah. But she basically said, I'm a whole person. And so my joy and the things that make yeah. me happy are part of me and there's room for for that as well. And I thought that was really cool. That's, that's so poignant because we, and black women especially, black women work harder than a motherfucker. And it'll be real, e and then like, what I want us to reframe in the community are conversations surrounding work. Uh, because what, 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 I, what I see a lot of the times is it, it becomes a, we have to hold ourselves accountable for the work that we're doing internally for our own self care. Mm. Meaning I have to be okay with saying, A, I need help. B, I'm tired and, and I need rest. Um, and holding the people who say that they care about us and love us accountable for showing up for us in that way and giving them room to do so. Because what I see a lot of times is motherfuckers are not allowing other people to show up for them. You know, because a lot of that is power and ego, 
right? Like, and goes all the way back to what we talked about, right? About being vulnerable and, and being soft and not being taken advantage of if I'm being sensitive or if I'm being too kind. And it's like, listen, man, we can't control how other people are going to receive how we show up in the world. All I can do as a black man, as a black citizen of America, is, is, is be forthcoming, be loving, be honest, be truthful, and give folks hopefully the opportunity to, to do the same. You know, we, we're very guarded as a community. And, and the work for me is to kind of have us, and granted, to be fair, I also have the privilege of being a man and being able to say that, right? Where like a lot of black women maybe don't feel like they, 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 they can let go of their defenses and, 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 and the guards they have up because of abuses in the community. You know what I'm saying? When you look at like a Russell Simmons or you look at an R. Kelly or Bill Cosby, or you just look at the neighborhood dude across the street, you know what I'm saying? Like there's not like, how can I be soft when there are, there are those who are in the community, in our own community, taking advantage of us. Mm. But the work, and like when we talk about black liberation, and we talk about liberation for, the, for, for, for black trans, for, for, for black femme, black women, what, what, whatever the case, non-binary individuals, that work is also allowing us to unpack the trauma that black men have faced so that they can show up and we can show up for each other in a way that creates open space for everybody. Man, that's so good. We got a, a couple more questions if that's cool. Yeah, man, listen, I'm here. I'm here all night. All right. The only thing is when the questions are long, the words get very small. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and it's like it's weird. And then sometimes they cut off, too. How can I help even if I'm afraid to speak up to the government? You know, here's the thing. And, and it's, it's very similar to what I think about the conversations we've been having about property, right, and looting. Mm -hmm. You know, Brittany Pacchetti said it better than I can. But, um, you know, <laughs> slaves were property, hmm. you know, like I, I, I and I think and I'll use I'll use my neighborhood of Fordham Road as an example. My um, my mother lives a block away from some of the looting that happened in our neighborhood. And, you know, my mom is very much like, no, looting, I didn't hate my mom was listening. So she's like very like anti any of that. You're destroying our community. And I'm like, yes, mom. OK, I hear you. I get it. You know, someone started a fundraiser for, for Fordham Road. The goal was $1,000, and he raised upwards of $40,000 in, in the course of the day, which to me says two things. Property is not more important than, than, than human lives, and then the community will show up if we get yeah. the opportunity to do so. Like, property can be replaced. And, and, and so with that, it's like, as a community, Black folks have been, you can look at Jim Crow, you can look at the Black Codes, you can look at the move bombings in Philadelphia, you can look at a number of different ways in which the community has had to show up in spite of the government. You know, and, and, you know, I don't want to get super dramatic, but for me, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm willing to die for this work, mm. you know, and because it's, it's about, it's about our liberation. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, and it's about like the, the, the ancestors who, who came before us, you know what I'm saying? Like Dr. King ain't die, ain't, 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 ain't die in front of that hotel for nothing. You know what mm. I'm saying? And, and, and like this weight to that. And I think it's important to understand that weight and not take that weight for granted because it's easy to do that because we have lives, right? Like we, we show up as family members, as members of the community, pillars of the community for some of us. But like the more we can recognize that we're all in relationship with each other. Like, Jamie, you're my brother, like regardless of such. And so if I'm thinking about that, my, my, if I'm thinking about that, what I, what I then recognize is that everything I do affects everybody else. Mm. Like if I'm in simple kindness of like, if I don't hold the door open for this person coming through, or if I'm rude to this clerk, you know, I don't know what their life is like once yeah. they leave this environment and how they're gonna show up in other spaces that can be violent to a community. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we say like, well, if we're afraid of the government, I'm like, yo man, fuck the government. The government don't care about us anyway. You know what I'm saying? To a certain extent. And so the work for us is to show up as a community for each other, how we supporting each other and how we protecting each other. And I don't mean by like picking up guns and like doing all types of like like if that's what you're deciding to do, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say no to that. But what I am gonna say is it's gonna be important for us to support each other as we navigate the space and then also create moments of create a, an atmosphere of safety so that folks feel protected enough to speak out in ways that are gonna that are gonna matter for us. Yeah. I wanna piggyback on her question. Um I feel like in like even looking at the top line of this question, how can I help even if I'm afraid? I feel like my experience has been that whether it's vulnerability, whether it's talking openly about 
mental health, if it's talking about yeah. injustice, things get easier with practice. Uh, I don't work out a lot, but I, I make the comparison. It's like, yeah. as you work out, it gets easier. Our muscles get stronger. And I wonder if you feel like that applies to someone who's sharing, hey, I want to show up, but I'm afraid. Yeah, I love that. I love that comparison, especially for another person who does not work out enough. <laughs> Shared experience. Um, yeah, that's absolutely it, actually. If you think, like, the, I got better as an artist because I just kept doing it. Yeah. And so people ask me, like, how, do you, how did you get on stage for a TED Talk? Or yada, yada, yada. How do you do, have this conversation? I have them all the time. Have them at work. Have them at the dinner table. I have them in workshops. I perform on stage. Like, that's what I do. You know, it's the more I do the work, it's a muscle. It's, it's habit. Mm. Habit. And so you then also learn ways to navigate that that are most comfortable for you. Mm. You know, like, because if it's, if it's not about speaking up to the government, it's about how can I support those who are, who are, mm. you know, like, how can I, if my money, if you got money, then donate that shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you got a platform and you, or you got a way in which you can highlight individuals who are doing the work, then do it. You know, or if it's again, the simple fact of just having a very difficult conversation mm -hmm. because the e e fear is ego. You know, it's like, I'm going to be rejected. People are going to try to clown me for it or I'm not going to have anybody supporting me. And that's the stuff that we have to work through in order to, 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 to be able to show up, not just for ourselves, but, but for the community at whole. Yeah. And don't forget to vote. Yeah, word, like vote, vote. And if you're not going to vote, if you're a person or the individual that feels like I don't feel as if any of these parties represent my, 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 my beliefs and values, then make sure you're doing some real grassroots work and supporting grassroots organizations that are trying to help um, eliminate um, the, 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 the two party process. Like you have to we have to be we're all not going to get there in the same way. You know what I'm saying? But like, as long as we're working towards liberation together, then I think we can get some, we can get some real shit done. Yeah. So this one is from my sister and she is part of the To Write Love on Her Arms team. Joelle, can you share where you've shared your voice within the To Write Love platform already? Um, I've been fortunate enough to write a blog or two. Um, we had like my, my, my early initiation in, in, into the crew was, uh, was, was the podcast. Yeah, um, which was such a wonderful, healthy conversation. Because I think that was probably one of the first. I mean, there were like a few conversations I was having before that, maybe one or two, but it was there that I really felt like there there were folks who were trained in navigating this space in a way um, that was sensitive to like my background and like super warm. And I think we got to tell like a really compelling story about how I show up in the world and like you know it won't be the last i'm here yeah I'm here now, right so yeah what about ted talk can we plug your ted talk <laughs> yeah we can plug the ted talk I, I gave a ted talk at uh the ted women's conference in december of 2019 the only you were the only man right i was the only man that was speaking at the <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was something it was something we're now i mean we're at i think 1.2 million views wow yeah and, and it, it's been it's been very humbling. Um, but yeah, it was about healthy co-parenting. And really, you know, healthy co-parenting, I think, applies to any, any and all individuals who are trying to work through um, how to be a support to their friends, colleagues, parents and partners, whomever. The work for me is ensuring that there's equity in households. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that, that, that's, that, that's where the talk stems from. I think this might be the last one we take uh, from these folks, how do you stay motivated and gain discipline? You know, I, it's probably an overused word for me, but empathy, because I think you're going to have slip ups and it, it's, it's about having mercy on ourselves when, when those things happen. I get motivated. I get motivated by listening and watching the community. I think my purpose is directly tied to the work of the movement. And when I speak of the movement, I, I, I'm speaking about decolonizing the, 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 some, of, some of the thematics I mentioned earlier, right? Like how we talk about mental health in the black community, um, how we talk about and deal with white supremacy, um, 
how we unpack masculinity and what that means and what that looks like and some of the, the stereotypes we lean into and the tropes we lean into. Um, I get excited about doing the work and I get excited about seeing other people show up for the work. So I think that's what keeps me motivated. And I honestly think the more that I see that the work has value, the, 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 the easier it becomes for me to just keep doing it. I think ever since COVID, my purpose has been become very, very clear and razor sharp to me about utilizing art and love in a way that's going to help uplift community, help support community, um, and also help folks sift through trauma um, and, and also use art as a resource. You know, like art, like writing, writing saved my life more than one day. And it's, be, it's per, very much part of my therapeutic practice. Um, I think specifically what, 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 what we can also do is like I, gratitude journals are like a key. Like that was something I learned in therapy, but like, it's okay to get really specific. Like I'm grateful for the fact that I, I can brush my teeth with my left hand. It's very random, yeah. you know, but, but it's, we, we sometimes tend to take the, the, the things that are, that feel small or like the minor minutia, we take those things for granted. But I think that speaks to the larger development of like being motivated about our purpose and being disciplined about the work that we're trying to do and accomplish. Mm. I feel like there are a lot of, lists right now obviously we we published an extensive one in terms of black leaders yeah. black voices but i wonder kind of on the heels of, of this question uh who are the folks or who are some of the folks that inspire you that encourage you who are the voices you've been looking to even recently yeah um kima Safir, um tiffany rose that's rose with words jamira burley um Brittany pacchetti um ebony janice um Y'all, you know, have been helpful in, in that way. Um, the NAP ministry, um, I think it's just a really powerful tool. Spotify, <laughs> honestly, like Spotify has been super helpful for me. Um, yeah. Wait, how so? Well, I mean, just really because like, I love music. You yeah. Know? Like making playlists, like I love feeding people. Like yeah. I get my joy from giving, like that's what makes me happy. So I'll make a playlist, I'll throw it up folks have downloaded. I love hearing feedback from people. Um, Ethel's Club, uh, which, which is the, the co-working space um, 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 for black and brown folks, which has now um, become a, a digital workspace for folks. Wow. They've been doing some really phenomenal work in the community and, and creating spaces also for like how we talk about therapy. I've done a couple of, work, of writing, you know, writing workshops with them as well. So Elizabeth Velasquez, the poet, um, amazing poet, um, Latinx, sister who's just doing phenomenal work um who really also um this is is is, is recognize like i love seeing folks who recognize their position in their platform and using their art um to, to activate the community and be activists as well so those are some of the folks last question yeah. i wonder in the midst of an incredibly heavy intense painful time if you are hopeful and if so, what you are hopeful for as it relates to this moment? I, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful. I'm excited. I'm excited for the, uh, the opportunity to reimagine the world. You know, for a while, I felt like I was being very naive about it. But I'll, I'll, a quick plug. And a quick plug to Dr. Shamel Bell, because she's the one that recommended this book to me. It's Freedom Dreams by um, Robin D.G. Kelly. And essentially, he's talking about liberation through, through the use of the imagination. And reimagining social movements as poetry um, because th there's a fluidity in poetry that, that allows us to see beyond the circumstantial. And I think that's what we're trying to see. It's like, what would it look like if we defunded the police? Mm. I don't know. You know, what would that look like? A good friend of mine, Jordan Howard, uh, we were just on a, on, a, on a quick call and she was super excited about just taking down statues. What does that look like? If we just say like, all, all, yeah. take down all these Confederate flags, what does it look like? What does it look like if we have a, a um, if, if we don't have a president, I don't know. What does it look like if we uh, have four, like, what are the things that we, 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 we look at as roadblocks, right? Like, man, if only if, like, all right, so then let's do it. There's nothing that's too big or pie in the sky, you know? Like, let's, let's and that's what gets me excited because I'm seeing people rising up and then also asking themselves, like, why? You know, why has been, I think, one, why is one of the greatest ways we get to unpack trauma and also get to unpack the possibilities and the potential of, 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 of our hearts and our dreaming and the work, 
You know, like, why are things the way that they are? Why can't they change? Who says that they can't? You know? Yeah. I, I don't know, but I, I'm willing to try and figure it out. And I feel like there's a lot of, there's a, a large contingent of people who are trying to do the same thing. Yeah. I love it, man. Um, yeah. I tried to X out the question, but it's it's frozen. So the question has joined us. <laughs> and then I, I was it's pressing buttons and I, <laughs> I, I turned, it was facing the wrong way and I felt bad and I couldn't get it I wasn't back. Gonna nothing. I was just going to let it, I was going to let it rock. I knew you were figuring something out. So it was all, it's, it's, uh, it's, well, it was funny because you, something, the way you were wording it related, it was like, what would it look like? And I just, I, I had to show people the other. <laughs> um, Joelle, man, you are amazing. I'm, I'm honored to, to get to know you a little bit and, and to, share this time and learn from you and hear some of your story and uh i'm excited to to hopefully be your friend <laughs> we're already friends man we already established that on that last call bro. okay okay uh but man thank you sincerely thank you for being here with us thank you this has been a pleasure i, I love i already told you man anytime like i love the work that y'all do and I, I just love how how you're listening and creating space. And I think it's not to be taken for granted or taken lightly. Yes, we need action. Mm -hmm. Dialogue is actually active as well. Love is active. Empathy is very active. It's a very active process. And it's important to honor that. The hard conversations can lead to better and, and stronger, more strategic actions moving forward. And couple, we have, as long as we're coupling that with action, with tangible ways that we can look towards a better, brighter future for the liberation of all peoples. But yes, very much so. Black trans folks, non-binary folks, black women, like that's what it's about. You know, indigenous folks, like you got privilege, show the fuck up. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like we all got privilege. I got privilege, whether I'm a black man or not, I'm still a man, I got privilege. So I got to use yeah. my platform to uplift black women voices, trans voices, whatever I got to do so we can wake the fuck up and do the work. Yeah. Well, we're gonna, sign this thing out together. I want to remind people, um, I mentioned two lists. We, we posted on Tuesday a list of mental health resources created by and for Black people. And with that, to remind you that we have scholarship dollars available. And you can apply through our website. You can explore that list through our site. And then today, um, earlier this afternoon, we added a list of ways that you can learn about and participate in anti-racism. So we've got a lot that we're able to offer. So we want to invite you to our website, twaloha.com. Um, please follow Joel, support his work, and uh, stay safe, stay healthy one day at a time. And we, we'll see you down the road. Joel, thank you so much, man. My brother, Jamie, appreciate you. Much love to you, man. Uh, same to you. Hey. Bye, everyone.